My mother once told me that as a child, she only had two people she could look up to, her great-aunt Mary and her Aunt Denny. Every generation of my family has named a daughter after Mary. The reasons became clear as I learned more about our family history. The men appeared long enough to become fathers and then disappeared through death or drinking. The women left behind coped as best they could, and sometimes it wasn't very well. Mary, with her independence, courage, and grace, stood out. On my 18th birthday, my mother gave me Mary's gold cross, her medals, and her martini pitcher. Those were the only clues I had until I found out that she had also left a history behind. September 21st, 1943. Dear Miss Connor, the Maryland Historical Society requested that I write an account of the University of Maryland Hospital Unit. I am sending you a copy of that account. You will probably not want to use this in its entirety, so do whatever you wish with the material. Sincerely yours, Mary Gavin. My mother named me after my great aunt Mary. She was not the warm, uh, fuzzy kind. You know what I mean? Did you think? No. no. She's not the warm, fuzzy guy. I just remember her as being charming and very giving and very loving. In that we would always get packages from Lord and Taylor. And she'd always send the most elegant or just suitable sweaters from Lord and Taylor for us. Cashmere. Every Christmas she sent me a Christmas present, and that meant a lot to me. And I didn't think that uh, Great Aunt Mary ever asked anything of you. But you knew that she but, would be there for you. Right, and that she was a kind person. Aunt Mary was a pioneer in, in her field. Of course, there were women nurses for ever since Florence Nightingale started that, you might say. But uh, it took a lot of guts and courage for Aunt Mary to do what she did. I mean, she just stood up for her rights, and that's why she ended up being a lieutenant colonel. She was good at what she did. <laughs> Mary was born in January of 1883 on Prince Edward Island, Canada. She was the younger sister of my great-grandmother, Jean. In 1900, after the death of their baby brother, Mary's father moved the family to Spokane, Washington. There, the only thing Mary and Jean seemed to have in common was that they both worked as teachers. Mary was the quiet one. It was Jean who was in the society page. She was social and outgoing and considered very pretty. And her ambition in life was to get married. Because I was raised in the period where the you were sort of trained to either be a nurse or a teacher or a secretary with the um, premise that your husband was going to take care of you when you got married. So I thought, well, if I go into nursing, maybe I'll meet a doctor. Um, I met some, but I married your father. John was discharged from the Army at Fort Lewis, Washington, and uh, on Christmas Eve in 1945, and we were married in Spokane in January. You might say almost a mail-order bride is what I was. In 1902, Jean Gavin quit teaching to marry my great-grandfather, Edward. They left the day after the wedding for St. Paul, Minnesota. Sixteen years later, at about the same time Mary was sailing for France, Jean threw him out of the house and raised their five children on her own. Edward had turned out to be a drunk.
Whether by conscious choice or instinct, Mary refused to follow her sister's path. When she left the family behind in Spokane, it wasn't to get married. Instead, she headed across the country to Baltimore and the University of Maryland School of Nursing. She found her place at the school. On Mary's evaluation, her instructor wrote, works well and intelligently, quiet, reliable, and dignified. Mary spent three years at the school and graduated with 14 other women. Several of them would go on to France with her, including her friend, Charlotte Cox. At their graduation, the nurses took the Nightingale Pledge. I solemnly pledge myself before God and in the presence of this assembly to pass my life in purity and to practice my profession faithfully. I will do all in my power to maintain and elevate the standard of my profession and will hold in confidence all personal matters committed to my keeping. With loyalty will I endeavor to aid the physician in his work and devote myself to the welfare of those committed to my care. Ten years later, the U.S. joined World War I. Patriotism ran high and the public was urged to sacrifice for the good of the country. It would be over a year before the U.S. was organized enough to send Mary and her nurses overseas. On April 2, 1918, I reported at Fort McHenry, Maryland, for a course of instruction in the duties of a chief nurse. I was appointed as such May 25, 1918. During the last week of May, orders for mobilization were issued to all members of the unit. Each day brought some of its members to New York. They were all thrilled to find that they were staying at the Bristol Hotel. Many invitations were issued to the members of the unit for teas, receptions, and automobile rides. Theater tickets were distributed liberally. One manager invited the entire unit to his theater as his guests one evening, and his was one of the most popular shows in New York at that time. The consecration of the nurses' flag took place one Sunday evening at a patriotic service at Old St. Paul's Episcopal Church in New York City. Hundreds of nurses who were mobilizing for overseas duty were present. The flag became a cherished possession, for when we arrived at our destination, we found that the hospital baggage had been delayed and that our nurse's flag was the only one on hand. For weeks it was used to bury the dead. Over a hundred bodies of those who died for their country were carried to their graves under its stars and stripes. On July 4th, the nurses of Base Hospital No. 42 took part in the Red Cross Parade in New York City. By this time, our military drilling had begun to take effect, and we made a very credible showing. We began to feel that sailing orders were imminent, and as each day passed with no news, a general restlessness became manifest. Now at this point, the Western Front 
was just about here, just north of the town of Verdun. If you followed the River Meuse 50 miles south of that, you came to Bezois. This is where Mary's Hospital would be located. On Saturday, July 13th, we started on the voyage which we had looked forward to for so long a time and with so much impatience. The trip across the Atlantic was delightful in every way. We were the only women on board, and everything was done for our comfort and pleasure. With two military bands on board, there was no lack of music, and there was dancing every afternoon. Well, there was kind of this family myth going on that has gone on, that there was a wartime lover. Well, there's a bracelet, and it's, it says Tiffany Paris. And so that sort of, he gave it to her, see. After a voyage of nearly two weeks, Mary and her nurses landed in Liverpool. Almost immediately, they were sent on to France. We were still in doubt as to our ultimate destination. In each instance, orders were issued only to cover our next stop. Finally, on July 31st, at four in the morning, we arrived in Chaumont. We were hungry, and as soon as the cafes began to open their doors, they were besieged. We then learned that Chaumont was general headquarters, and that General Pershing was quartered in that town. The place took on a new interest, and when the streets began to fill with American officers and men, I felt that we were indeed in the midst of the American Expeditionary Force. The ride from Chaumont to Neufchateau was a short one. On our arrival, we were met by Captain Ogle, who provided ambulances to take us to Bazois. None of us had any idea that we were coming into such a tremendous hospital center as it proved to be. It seemed like a small city of one-story wooden buildings. The officers and men of 42 had preceded us by about two weeks. They had already got the base into some sort of shape, and I felt when we arrived that we were home at last. After a survey of the wards and a consultation between the commanding officer and myself, the nurses were assigned the various wards to get them in readiness for receiving patients. Miss Charlotte Cox was assigned as my assistant and Miss Frances Branley as head nurse of the operating room. There was much work to be done in the way of preparation. One of the things that was impressed upon us was that the supply of surgical dressings that we would need when we began to receive the wounded would be enormous.